The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, something untoward happens in Taurus when SN1006 takes it to the Chandrasekhar limit one more time. Mysterious felices and vituperative velociraptors. And some special audio material from the past resurfaces like an oily rainbow. And that's all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. Hey, this time we have an interview with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, who discuss the latest entry in the Lead Universe series. That book's called The Gathering Edge. This year marks the 29th anniversary of the first publication of the first Leaden Universe novel. It's a great series to get into. Really, any point in the series works, and there's a vast universe to explore there. In fact, I believe this is the 20th novel in the series. And we take an interim look back at some previous audio material that's appeared on the podcast while we prepare for the next great novel, Serialization. And I can't tell you what that is yet until it's absolutely finalized, but it may have something to do with the subjects of our interview this time. So that's coming up. Now, here's the news. Oh, may you make us blush with your wonderful new offerings in hardcover and trade paperback. First off is the latest entry in the Leaden Universe science fiction series, The Gathering Edge, by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. And we'll have lots more on that in a moment when we talk to Sharon and Steve. This one is a series milestone. And yes, it is the 20th amazing entry in the nationally best-selling Leaden Universe series. The luck runs rough around Theo Waitley. Not only are people trying to kill her and capture the self-aware intelligent ship Bishimo, to whom Theo is bonded, they're also trying to arrest her crew members. No wonder Theo feels the need of a break and retires to what Bishimo refers to as safe space. But when strange ships start appearing from the next universe over, it seems that Bishimo's safe space is about to become deadly perilous. Also newly out is Dark Ship Revenge by Sarah A. Hoyt. After winning the Civil War in Eden, Athena returns to her calling, collecting power pods with her husband Kit. Now weeks away from Earth, she goes into labor. Then, as a bioengineered plague wreaks havoc on the forces of liberty, Athena must risk herself, her husband, and her child for the survival of humanity. The disgraced genetically engineered mules seeking to return to power may be about to find out what revenge truly is. One angry mother. And out in May is The Gods of Sagittarius by Eric Flint and Mike Resnick. Russ Tabor is one of the top security specialists in the galaxy. Much against his will, he finds himself assigned to provide protection for the human race's most brilliant and annoying savant. The savant has become convinced that the race of ancient aliens known as the Old Ones possess powers unknown to any modern intelligent species. He believes they had harness forces which may well have been actual magic, giving the Old Ones the stature of gods. Now, human adventurers and an alien shaman are on a collision course with the truth. Despite their many differences, only if they unite their forces do they stand any chance of surviving the coming encounter with the gods of Sagittarius. The Gathering Edge by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, Dark Ship Revenge by Sarah A. Hoyt, and The Gods of Sagittarius by Eric Flint and Mike Resnick are now at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Sharon Lee and Steve Miller to the podcast. Hey, folks. Hi, Steve. Um, Sharon Lee and Steve Miller began co-authoring their tales of the Leaden universe 29 years ago, right? Next year will be 30, or is that not right? Oh, let me see. Uh, if we're going by publication date, Agent of Change came out in February of 1988. But it was written in 1984. Yeah. Well, it came out in 88, so that'll be a 30-year anniversary next year, right? That, that sounds right. <laughs> the series went through a number of publishers until Bain Books saw a wonderful opportunity 
to reissue the series about maybe 11 years ago now, um, and to ask Sharon and Steve to write more Lead Universe novels. For the past 10 plus years with Bane, they've done exactly that with um, previous Lead novels Fledgling, Saltation, Mouse and Dragon, Ghost Ship, Dragon Ship, Necessity's Child, Trade Secret, Dragon in Exile, and Alliance of Equals. Sharon and Steve are also the authors of other Bane novels, and Sharon's solo Archer Speech contemporary fantasy series includes novels Carousel Tides, Carousel Sun, and Carousel Seas. The original Leaden Universe novels have been collected into uh, Bane omnibus editions as well, so everything Leaden is, uh, in, as much as we can get, we, we've got out there. And there are three volumes of short stories and novellas set in the Leaden Universe, the Leaden Universe Constellation, uh, volume one, two, and three. And now available at booksellers everywhere is the latest entry in the Leaden Universe series, The Gathering Edge. Sharon and Steve, in The Gathering Edge, we are back with um, Theo Waitley, um, wonderful character. I think, when did we last see her in Necessity's Child, or did we see her last book? Uh, it's not. Theo is, is bonded with Beckamo, or Bechamo, um, who's a ship and he's an AI ship, but can you just bring us up to speed on where we are in the in the in her storyline? The last time we actually saw Theo was in Dragon Ship. Mm. And this the Gathering Egg um, constitutes what what is of the fifth book in the Theo Waitley arc. So the people who joined us when we were doing fledgling live on the web and bonded to Theo, there's now a fifth book. Also giving away a small secret, um, Bashimo was uh, originally named after a ghost ship that sailed, uh, that did sail the Arctic Ocean and the uh, Pacific Ocean for a while, called Bay Shimo, or meaning the Bay of Shimo. Oh. And uh, and that that was kind of the, the beginning of uh, Bashimo as a as a name for a spaceship. And that, and that came from the fact that the first time we see Bishimo um, in Faltation is as a, a phantom blip on, on a radar screen. He's a ghost ship. So, me picturing him as Louis Armstrong is not probably the way that... Uh, <laughs> that's not going to work out at all. Okay. All right. Um, so what does it mean for Theo to be bonded with Bishimo, and what? how did that happen? Theo was in a jam, which is not totally unusual for Theo, um, and she needed help, and she needed to level up, basically, to rescue members of her crew, and so she took about took advantage of the quote-unquote bonding, not spaceship, she don't do this with, but the, the bonding um, program that was built into the Shimo, which, make, which allows her to have access to other things. Um, and actually in Gathering Edge, Theo is still finding out what those things are. Uh, the, the fact that uh, Shimo is an old ship is that uh, Shimo was built to be the next great thing at a time when the when there was quite a bit of confusion going on in, in the uh, space travel world, and they were afraid, actually, of what Bishimo might be able to do. And one of those things that they were afraid of, in effect, was the possibility that the uh, pilot, the captain, and the ship would communicate much faster and much more clearly through the bonding process, that they would become, in effect, a, uh, a unit, a, a a real, a real time team, in ways that the pilots weren't and captains weren't able to uh, otherwise. And that technology had been lost when uh, Bishimo was essentially frightened away before he took on his first trip. But yeah. much of this, much of this becomes uh, yeah, more of fully explained in in the book, and and it actually covered. It. There's a what's what's there's a Bishimo uh, centric short story as well that we've we've had up at Baynuck. Is there not? Um, trying to think of the title. How many short stories? So many times. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, it's in one of the constellations, if there is one. Um, he's, but this is the reason he's kind of, he's very shy, but he's careful, right? He's very careful, yes. Yeah. Theo at one point asked him if he's sure he's a spaceship. <laughs> he's that careful. To do anything that's not safe. And it has come to his attention that human beings are terrifically frail and very breakable. And so he's, he's extra um, nervous about putting his crew into any situation that is quote unquote not safe. And he's, uh, this came from the fact that he's just had to flee. Um, he, he had to run away to survive. He's he's very old, right? He's like centuries old. We haven't done the exact count, but I'm sure one of our fans will eventually <laughs> go, go back to the short stories and the novels and let us know exactly how old he is. So when we start um, The Gathering Edge, um, Bishimo, Theo, and, and the, her crew are out in the middle of nowhere in uh, this area called Safe Space, or they call it that. Um, what, where are they? What are they doing there? What they're doing there is, um, at the end of Dragon Ship, something bad happens or something unsafe happens. And the ship's keys have become compromised, so they've gone to the safe space so that Fushima can manufacture more keys for each of the crew members that are not compromised. So that's why they're there. And they're only supposed to be there for a very short time. And, uh, Bishimo has, has the uh, tendency to extend short times of safety to longer times of safety. After all, there were times that he, he previously had sat in that particular spot for a decade or two before deciding to move on. So at this point, he's got his crew in a location. They've had a number of, uh, close. of, of close calls and adventures uh, with various Entities, including the Department of the Interior, which is one of the main enemies to Clan Corval. So, in, in general, they were trying <clears throat> they were trying to be safe, to regroup and repair. Yeah, and obviously something's going to happen. Uh, but before we uh, before we maybe get into the story, um, can you explain a little bit about? We've hinted that AIs are are not incredibly welcome. Um, in this part of the, the universe. In Alliance of Equals, we learned the fate of Admiral Bunter, for instance, and a lot of the characters in the series are AIs, and uh, they're, they're generally kind of, they're not in charge, they're scared, usually, um, or freaked out. What is, um, what's the state, how does AI work in, in this world, and why um, are some people hating on them so much? Well, there are these things called the complex logic laws, which um, make it, quote unquote, illegal to be or manufacture or befriend or hide an artificial intelligence. And those are left over from <clears throat> the, the artifacts of two, of two different parts of the history of the uh, universe that we're dealing with. One of those is actually a part of the history of the previous universe, pardon me, the, the universe that the liaisons escaped from, the, Chris, the universe that's in Crystal Soldier and Crystal Dragon, uh, a universe where the enemy had uh, a very powerful enemy, among other things, had created uh, killer machines that planet eaters, planet eaters, and things like that that were all that were that ran on automatic, and we did cover that briefly in one of our short stories, but at also, the Terrans, after the uh, after everybody came over from the other universe, the Terrans had uh, gone through a rapid period of expansion, and as part of that, they had created fleets of robot craft. And those robot craft, uh, including uh, Jeeves, as we did, as we uh, explained, who, who is now Corvall's house butler, uh, including Jeeves who had been an admiral in those wars, uh, had uh, done so much damage that as those machines were eliminated, it was thought best not to have anybody, anybody that is literally anybody, any intelligent artificial um, devices anymore. So they're allowed machines that are 
that they can do things through, through programming, but not things, not machines that should be self-programmable and so, uh, so there's a name for it, self deciding yes. Right. Basically what happened is humans almost wipe themselves out, so they blame their tools. Yeah. Well, why is, um, so who is it that's after, um, say, Bishimo? Um, well, there were bounty hunters after Bishimo. There's also the Department of the Interior, which has a really unhealthy um, interest in old tech. And there's some question about whether Bishimo is, quote unquote, old tech, which would have been technology that came over from the old universe and is now failing because the Timonium which powers them has reached its half life and no longer stable. Mm -hmm. The other people who are after Bishimo right now um, are a group of scouts from the scout corps that is charged with collecting old tech and destroying it. In order to keep the universe safe. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, he's got good reason to. He's he's not paranoid because people are actually out to get him. <laughs> so. He actually is in danger. Um, and Bishimo uh, was we went into his backstory a little bit. What was that again? He's he was created to. He was created as a family ship by by a group of people right about the time in trade secret when the loop. Were, were being readjusted, the trade loop routes were being readjusted because of a um, situation with a galactic cloud. I'm not sure if uh, looking at me like, what are you talking about? No, actually, <laughs> actually there, there were a number, uh, a number again, uh, a universe is a big place and think a lot of things are going on. Uh, Bishima was the, the first, the culmination of a, uh, of a project to permit the ship that is trade ships along with their their families and and this was intended to be a, a family ship to uh, make many of the decisions they needed to make without reference to to uh, to other people and the ship was designed in fact to be kind of a super captain and also a team member uh, to be alert to be to be personable and and to be a person, and those things were going on. They were, and it became known that that's what what was happening. Bishimo and the people who were trying to set up this new system of trade were were hounded at almost entirely out of existence. Uh, so your uh, this is the uh, this is your science fiction extension of self driving cars. No, no. AI hey, has been in science fiction for a long, long time. I mean, there was Joe the beer opener. Yes, of course. Um, and our Dan, our Dan Eel. Yes, that's the <clears throat> Yeah. Um, what are, uh, let's talk about some of the, the other characters. Um, also aboard are an engineer and a pilot. We talked about Theo um, a little bit. The, uh, the other people on board, Kara, um, Wian Tan, um, how did they get involved? What are they doing there? How do they feel about each other? No, the, the, this whole, she will go, this whole problem is Wian Tan's fault. Uh, there would be no Mishima, there would be no CEO bonded with Mishima as Wian Tan had screwed up. Yeah, and that's, you know, we, we've got about, I don't know, seven books. Seven books, at least, that, that, that have been involved in this, that with short stories and, and everything else counted. Um, Bishimo had decided in the distant past very quickly to uh, land himself beside other ships potentially of this class and, and some some few that had some, some amount of smarts but were not actually uh, intelligent. And he was kind of sitting in a in a preserve that the scouts had set up near some of those ships in case something happened. And what happened was that Winton came in, and rather than checking uh, checking inventory, he was his job at this point was to go to the warehouse site and check the inventory and make sure that things were in the state reported in the inventory. He found something that was not on the inventory. 
which was Kashimo, and through a series of, um, of miscues and misunderstandings, waking up Kashimo, and then rather than leaving everything as they found it, he wandered off with several sets of keys to Bishimo. And since the keys were uh, at loose in the universe, Bishimo being alert uh, was paying attention to the keys at a distance. This is some of the old tech kind of things working. Uh, and the, uh, the result being that through many, many adventures, Theo yeah. winds up with a set of keys. She winds up with, as Theo, as Linton believes, the co-pilot key. But in fact, she has that the captain's key. Mm -hmm. So it, in various ships, lots of advent, in various um, installments, lots of adventures happen, and we probably shouldn't go through the entirety oh. <laughs> right now. Oh. But anyhow, the whole reason for this situation is that Linton um, went, entered this ship that wasn't on the inventory and woke it up. All right. And he's, um, what's he like as a character? It's, um, it's getting better. Um, <laughs> he, he, he was uh, an extremely ambitious and, uh, yeah. and, and, and almost a know-it-all. He was pretty sure he had everything worked out. He knew what was going to happen. He ran into Theo and through various adventures again, uh, became involved with her. In, in a number of fashions, uh, resulting in her ending having the key to Bishimo, Bishimo coming looking for her, and at the same time, because the scouts were also involved in many things going on on Liad, remember Liad? This is Liad in universe, yeah. Uh, because of things that were happening there, Winton became uh, a target as a way of getting to Bishimo and took great damage, which is how he ended up on the ship. Uh, again, we, we'd be we'd be talking yeah, two books you, worth of material. You need, to, they, you need to read the book. Well, he's a he's a chastened uh, know-it-all. What about Kara? A school friend of Theo. As, as far as can be said to be old, because they've only known each other several years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, but they went to school together. They were, they were on, uh, what is it, Delgado together? Or? And Lyndon. And Lyndon Pilot School. Ah. Uh, England and Poly oh, Pilot the Academy. Academy. Right. And that was that. Oh, dear. Forget. We've got too many. We're, see, we're, we've already finished the book ahead of this. Right. After <laughs> this. And, so we're, and we're plotting the book. The no, books, two no, books no. at the same time now. So sometimes the, oh yeah, I know exactly what that is. Hang on, Tony, we're getting this for you. Uh -huh. Well, uh. It's not Delgado, it is. Where did Theo grow up? He grew up on Delgado. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not where she went to school. Oh, okay. But her parents were, uh, were scholars there, or her foster parents, or. The planet of Elot. Her mother. Yeah. And is on the planet of Elot, and um, they again had many adventures there. They keep saying adventure. Right. They, they had a kind of a civil war. Yeah. Um, and um, Kara and uh, and Kara is part of the indigenous um, indigenous is that the word? Yeah, that's close to it. Yeah. Um, Elot has had a um, Population made up of parents and liaisons, and they had managed to work that for quite some time until some people came in and said, "This isn't right. Parents ought to run things." Mm -hmm. But Kara can actually not go back home at this point. She's not really sure what happened to her family. Uh, and we have uh, a Norbear. Right. Yes. Uh, Havilan. Havilan. Uh, and they are impasse. I guess you would say something like that. Norbears? Yes. They're they're they're, they're natural um, impacts with al almost with good enough hands to to do it whatever they want. And if they can't do what they want, they manage to convince other people to do it for them. Um, and Hevelin Hevelin builds networks. He likes to know who's related to who, who knows who, who does what, 
And this is all Ulupi Bashar's fault because she collected for a while, um, and probably still does, Prince, Jer Prince Charles Spaniels. Prince Charles Spaniels are very pretty little dogs, but they do nothing. They, they're not, they're just big eyed dogs. <laughs> at one point, but what are they for? And she said, they are for having influential friends. So that's what Hebel is. <laughs> I see. Well, um, and all right, so those three are on board, and there's also another AI. We've, we've gotten uh, into a, quite, a, uh, quite a motley crew here. There's another AI that's kind of the spawn of Bashimo. Um, uh, he, was, he was actually created as a subroutine to be the comm officer, the communications officer. Yeah. And that's Joyita. 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 And a very different personality from Mishima, also. More verbal. Yeah, yes, he is. He is more verbal. And part because he, as, as he was created from, from memory of the, uh, of the initial training that Bashimo got, that Bashimo isolated because they weren't necessary to what he was doing now. And then when he suddenly needed a face, a, a face uh, he, created, he started this subroutine team up and said, okay, you go do your stuff and, and let me do the important thing. Eventually you're resulting in, in uh, a, a portion of himself becoming independent that remembered the training officer and in some ways fixated on that training officer and became uh, an outgrowth of that training officer, even though that training officer is long and dead. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, in fact, became, uh, you know, it's somebody with a, a split personality, except that personality has, has been given enough power and enough uh, room within the memory banks to become his own, his own person. Yeah. And become his own person to the extent that... Um, there's a couple of characters that we well, um, who think it is a person, a, a human. Oh no, he was supposed to be. The, the reason Julieta even became a subroutine is because um, at the beginning of Bashimo's flight, there were only two crew members. There was Theo and Clarence O'Baron, her, her subpilot. Mm -hmm. it, it, it came to Bashimo's attention that. Because the crew was so lightly, the ship was so lightly crewed that people might take advantage of his crew and put them in an unsafe situation. So he created this subroutine to be a face and a voice so it would look like there was another crew member. Ah. <clears throat> so this is, an, this is an outgrowth of many of the uh, events that occur have, have occurred in the series are actually outgrowths of Bashimo trying to be safe. Yes, safety first. So, um, all right, well, let's, coming over from another universe, um, which is the crystal universe, I guess, that we have a couple of interesting characters. These are soldiers belonging to this thing called the troop who are on a mission. Um, what is, what's the universe that they're fleeing from like? This harks back to some of the... Uh, this is, yeah, crystal, the crystal book, crystal soldiers. Yeah. Um, that universe has been taken over by the powerful enemy called the Shereka, the enemy, um, who have decided that organic things are very, very messy and uh, are not to be tolerated, and they are going to freeze the universe, which is a steady state universe, so this makes it much easier for them, um, and crystallize so that nothing changes. And that way we don't have organics anymore, which are very, we don't want to deal with them at all. They're perfect. So the soldiers, this war is long lost, and the soldiers are basically the last people to get out of what has been a, a huge migration. Um, they're on the tail end of, of the list of ships that are trying to leave the universe before the last door is shut. So this is where the Leadens come from originally. And the Terrans. And the, and the Terrans. So, um, who are, uh, 
But this has happened centuries ago, um, most of this migration, and now two more show up. Um, what happens that, that they suddenly show up in Theo's time? Oh, they, they hit the time warp again. Um, Just no. dang time warps. Yeah. In, in, in effect, we're, we're talking about, um, when, when you're talking about collapsing universes and the expelled uh, material expelled from collapsing universes, but we're not talking about something that's uh, without confusion and without the. Uh, so time warp is is the wrong it's word. It's the wrong word, but it's it's useful. It's a useful one. Uh, it, it, it affects the the. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of the right. It's, okay. it's, it's sort of inherent in the Leyden universe. When the people came through from the migration, they did not all come through at the same spot in the new universe, or even in the same time, because of all these energies that were being released. Yeah, for, for. So you would rise at different ways. There were some planets that have apparently been colonized forever, because those people got through first and were able to come. The liaisons are, are part of the, you know, the first sure, wave. Sort of the first wave, yeah. Um, uh -huh. But <clears throat> why the scouts? formed was to go look for the other people who had come through. Initially. Okay. Initially, that was very initial. Oh, okay. Um, what is, uh, so who are who are these two? Um, there is um, uh, Chernak and Stast. Yeah. Um, Stast is the leader. Uh, no, no, Chernak is the leader. Chernak's the leader, sorry. The elder. Um, it's the elder by a few seconds. Right. And they are what you would call brother and sister. They were born together. They've never been apart. Really. They trained together. Um, they went on missions together. And they are part of an elite core, kind of like the scouts, kind of like the explorers. They're called pathfinders. Um, and they are not ordinary troops. They're sent on special missions. They're sent to find people who they're sent to sabotage things. Um, it's an elite core. Their last mission. And, and they're, they're, they're somewhat surprised to still be alive when they show up in the new universe. And uh, when they do, one of the things that they discover is that in this universe, circles aren't round the way they're used to. That is to say that pi, pi maintains, and so it's an expanding universe rather than the steady state universe that they had come. And so, uh, it's a hard time getting your head around. So hold it. It's doing what? Yeah. So so they're um, <clears throat> so. But what they are is uh, they they are exceptional people, and uh, that they happen to be uh, most closely related in the Liang universe. They're most closely related to the X Strang, which becomes an issue with that. Right. In several books. Because the X Strang have become sort of pirate figures and. Well, yeah, the X-Men lost their purpose on the front. Um, and they, they, they set up, I can't that. say much more, they set up Temp's headquarters and they waited um, until they got bored and then they started to, to try to do something. They tried to do something and the only thing they knew how to do was to be soldiers so they went to conquer things. Mm -hmm. Which made some kind of a spirit to everybody else. That's most in turn I have, uh, <coughs> have come through um, with extreme luck and um, and perseverance and they the help of a nice engineer, a brilliant engineer who expires on the way perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, jump. Yeah. And they are very wary because they've just come from a place where their universe is being destroyed. <laughs> right. They need to figure out what the hell's going on here. Right, they do, and they're very wary of things like thinking machines because those were usually those belong to the enemy. Ah, uh, yes. Um, right. They that was the the great works that great works that's that basically destroyed the their universe. Um, and there's another character. You could the thing is is that all these uh, these various uh, dudes are incredibly cool. Also, there is. Uh, 
a character, it doesn't seem at all a character at first, but it is strapped into a co-pilot's chair um, of a wrecked vessel, and it pops over from that universe. Um, that actually happened at the end of Dragon Ship, and they're trying to figure out what to do with it as the gathering and open. Yeah. Um, is it is it from the same? It's from the same universe, right? As um, it seems like most of the same. There, there has been shrapnel and, and debris. I think the debris. There had been debris. In fact, one of the most uh, uh, famous of those pieces of debris was a teapot. A teapot, an intact teapot from the old universe that mm -hmm. floated out. And Bishimo had, on one of his earlier experiments, um, taken that aboard because. Interesting, and it was safe with the Um, but you know, back in the crystal book, um, one of our pilot heroes um, sends her ship out, her personal ship out, we'll put that, no, I'm sorry, spiraled in, um, out with a baby tree, she's triad, um, strapped to the co pilot's chair in order to act as a, um, Diversion for the enemy. Diversion and decoy. And a decoy, so that the enemy would avert his eyes from what was going on to to make the migration um, happen. And the trees, these trees are are like the Leaden's tree. Um, they're sentient in some manner. They, they are biochemists. Yes, they were. Hmm. They had a world once, and they they actually withstood the enemy. It was with the enemy. They drove the enemy back. One tree left. No enemy. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So, a great deal of the novel is about Theo and her crew coming to uh, an understanding with Stost and Chernak, or Chernak and Stost. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us, like, how might this be, be achieved? What is what's their plan, and uh, how does it perhaps go awry? Theo comes from a family of scholars, which we were just talking about. And so her really core belief is if you give people, if you teach people to read and give them enough stuff, they'll reach the proper conclusion. So that's the basic plan at first. And uh, they do have Winton. Winton is a scout, so he's able to, to uh, give and bring some advice. They're not. They had not planned on this happening, so now that once, once it did happen, the amount of time they had in order to deal with it uh, was actually very brief. They had uh, faced a situation, and again, I don't want to give away too many of the uh, early events in the book, but they had faced a situation where suddenly there were uh, there was a wreck, an enormous an enormous wreck actually, and then. They discovered that there were survivors, and they had to decide one whether they were going to flee, which is the Bishimo safe plan, right. or were they going to do something about the survivors? And and Theo is not going to leave survivors. Yeah. and it's not an easy rescue. No, it was not an easy rescue. And and so they they have got to risk themselves, and then they're invested. And once they're invested, they get these people on board. They've got to figure out how to talk to them if they can. Uh, they're apparently, they are apparently people. They, they've established they, that they're capable of speaking that, 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 and all of those kinds of things. So, but they're kind of on both sides. They're, they're, they're kind of running with what they've run. They've got to, to work something out as fast as they can. And, not uh, kill each other. And that's, that's a literal not kill each other. And one of the things that we started to talk about this and got interrupted by static, one of the things that Theo took with her into this safe spot was a request from her half-brother and from the guy she was working for, the trader she was working for, to go home to Shore Blake because space has become too dangerous, she's become a target. And she's still deciding whether or not that actually has anything to do with her or whether she's but going she to continue um, what she was doing. Uh. And Sherbleek is the, the new home world that, that um, Clan Corbel has set up after they had a bit of a to do on uh, on their home planet. So, and she's trying to decide on whether or not she's going to um, listen to her older half brother or 
Governor, who carried his insisting as her down and under the Aiken rule, when your down says something, you do it. Yeah. And Theo does not count Galpan as her down because she counts herself as current. And she comes from a world <coughs> that where the women are where uh, that matriarchy is, is too too short a term and too limited a term to describe the way that the world has worked. Uh, automatically in in Theo's idea, if she has a brother, even an older brother, even an older brother should come under her care because he's only a guy. Yeah. Now Balcon is married to what to a woman that Theo allows is a very sensible and competent woman who mostly keeps him out of trouble. So so but so so she's got um we we have a uh, lot communication problems going on and a lot of cultural oh, okay. clash. Not only so you've got and you've got the Stoic and Turner culture clash clash, you've got the Shurbleek and Leighton culture clash, you've got the uh, brother and sister culture clash and you've got trader versus uh, and it's here culture clash. So there's all kinds of things going on to um to help complicate that. Well, assuming every, at least that the uh, that our uh, our universe hopping pathfinders can figure out how to how to uh, live in this this new place, um, what uh, I'm asking you to like give us a sort of a, a broad idea of what the uh, the action in the latter part of the book might involve. What they're gonna Theo's got to. Uh, She's got to decide what to do in that regard, and there's people still after them. And what she decides to do is, with the input of her, her crew, they decide to go back and over Mishima's objections because it's not safe, um, go back out into the universe to touch, to take Daka as a more or less um, innocent, innocent place and take more news. And that should that should work. Right? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so uh, I'd like to mention also there's a great related story um, by Sharon and Steve called C Cutting Corners at uh, Bain.com website right now. It's also going to be available in the uh, Free Short Stories 2017 ebook collection that you can get at BainEbooks.com. Um, is I was trying to think how it's related to uh, to the Gathering Edge. Actually, actually the, um, the cargo master there is wound up teaching at Anglings and Paladin Academy. He taught Kara, Kara uh, to you. Yeah. And at one point when they're trying to figure out something that I don't want to talk to you about, um, they invoke his teaching of, of how we should go about doing this. Yeah. And the cargo master in the uh, in that story is um, is also quite a quite a pilot even if he hasn't got his stripes as it were well, he's, he's, a, he's a workman pilot he's a third class yeah initially there is a um, silhouette no that's not what it's called uh, of, of Evelyn, Evelyn, Evelyn right. um, and in his in his earlier incarnation there's also in in there a, uh, a passing reference to a character who was involved in an earlier who was involved in dragon ship and who Theo knows who 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 Theo briefly yeah so just, there's a number of um, interconnections for the uh, large many cases that's called for the fans who've already read the earlier um, portion but apparently the st the story stands pretty well on its own too. It's the story of a frustrated man who needs to do something right now. Right, so and, you need to do something. And um, so Yeah, yeah, it's a great great little short story in itself. So uh, what are y'all working on? You mentioned some of it. It sounds like we're uh well, we're working on the fifth book of a five book hmm. um The Gathering Edge is the third, Neo Genesis, which comes out in January, um is the fourth. And now we're just we're planning, we're staring at the wrap up point. And and an additional volume as well. Because the uh what what's happened is that we've had several more books effectively added to the to the contract. We started we started out in two thousand and twelve going all five books. Mm -hmm. We are in two thousand and fourteen. 
How do you how do you reconcile that when you're writing them that uh, well, no well I mean you know how do you how do you remind yourself oh it's only been a little time for actually sometimes you you write a section of the book and you go you know what they're not that old mm -hmm. one of the things that does happen I uh, I, I mentioned this not too long ago in a, in a different interview. Um, every so often, we have to go back in and actually reread our own work. Uh, I was on a panel at Bosco a couple of years ago with some well-known uh, major writers who were describing their databases. They had this to remember things by, and that. And I think that's an inadequate way of doing it by using a database and saying, "Oh yeah, they were there then." Uh, because what well, when we go back in it's and really reread cool. the book that's most Appropriate, or, the, or in several cases, the, the book, a book, a book, and another book, um, in order to get the feel back, in order to, to dive into the, the characters, uh, it, what, what do they call it? Method acting? Is that what it's called for, among the, um, the yeah. acting people where they put themselves that, that much into a character? Well, that's what we, we try to do. We will go back in and reread things. And we should laugh at the right point. If we haven't laughed at the right point, then we're not in the mood yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we should uh, be upset at the, at the right point when we when we do the reread. So we do try to uh, reinvest ourselves in the characters from from where they were. And and when you have to go sometimes back five books or nine books to find the right uh, right angle, well, it, it, it it can be iffy. But we do try to do it that way. Judging by your readership, you're getting it right. Um, well, for us to get back into these characters, uh, including Theo and Bishimo and, and such, I uh, need to pick up the new uh, hardcover of The Gathering Edge by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, which is out at booksellers everywhere. Uh, Sharon and Steve, thanks so much for being with us again and uh, telling us uh, about this wonderful universe you've created and the latest uh, great story set in it. Thank you for calling. Thank you for having us. And now here is a poem by the great World War I poet Wilfred Owen. It's read by Tom Kratman, creator of the Carrera series. Here is Tom Kratman reading Wilfred Owen. Dulc et decorum est. Wilfred Owen, killed in action, 1918. Bent double like old beggars under sacks, knock-kneed, coughing like hags, we cursed through sludge. Till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and toward our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched to sleep. Many had lost their boots but limped on, bloodshot. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue deaf even to the hoots of gas shells dropping quietly behind. Gas, gas, quick boys! An ecstasy of fumbling. 
fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin, if you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitten as the cud of vile and curable sores on innocent tongues, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, Gulka et Coram est, pro patria, mori. Apologia pro poemate mio, Wilfred Owen, killed in action, 1918. I too saw God through mud, the mud that cracked on cheeks when wretches smiled. War brought more glory to their eyes than blood, and gave their laughs more glee than shakes a child. Merry it was to laugh there, where death became absurd and life absurder. For power was on us as we slashed bones bare, not to feel sickness or remorse of murder. I, too, have dropped off fear behind the barrage, dead as my platoon, and sailed my spirit surging light and clear past the entanglement where hopes lay strewn, and witnessed exultation, faces that used to curse me scowl for scowl, shine and lift up with passion of oblation, seraphic for an hour, though they were foul. I have made fellowships, untold of happy lovers in old song. For love is not the binding of fair lips with the soft silk of eyes that look and long by joy whose ribbon slips. But wound with war's hard wire whose stakes are strong, bound with the bandage of the arm that drips, knit in the webbing of the rifle thong. I have perceived much beauty in the horse oaths that kept our courage straight, heard music in the silentness of duty, found peace where shell storms spouted red as spate. Nevertheless, except you share with them in hell the sorrowful dark of hell, whose world is but the trembling of a flare, and heaven but as the highway for a shell, you shall not hear their mirth, you shall not come to think them well content by any jest of mine. These men are worth your tears, you are not worth their merriment. That was some fun from a previous podcast. Next week, we began the serialization of another novel on the podcast. Can't wait for that. But for now, that's it for the podcast. Thanks to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz and the ancient alien technological leavings of 50,000 civilizations that retired to playing the long greens on the event horizon of the singularity. And the thanks and praise of readers and readers who are yet to be but through a twist in space-time, are inexplicably happy about it now. For Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, authors of The Gathering Edge, please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars 